Hello, friends, and welcome to another episode of Just Another Kill Team podcast, where today we've got our regularly scheduled co-hosts. I am Jay Fay. Travis over here. And today we also have John Reynolds here. Hello. All the way from Springfield, Illinois. Springfield, Illinois. That's right. So here we are today bringing the local Springfield, Illinois meta to your ears. And John, I met John at Chicago Open last year where he's been taking the Colts. I think you're the top rated cultist player or gene sealer cult player, sorry, in the U.S. at the moment. Yeah, uh, I think the world. But once again, we are talking about the smallest pond you can imagine. Uh, you know, all yeah, the other cultist like players drop right. off. Uh, yeah, I've been playing cultists uh, basically since day one of the new edition. Uh as we kind of talked about before, uh, fell into them because I had a Necromunda gang that was basically one operative short, one or two operatives short of the Wormblade team. And I've been running them ever since. And uh, I do have Legionnaires now, but uh, I still think Wormblade are what I'm going to stick with for any event that I go to. For any listeners who don't know, John's Wormblade have this really cool display case that follows them around and they look great. They're all over the Goonhammer article where John uh, regularly shows up for the last couple tournaments because he's made the top three. Yeah, um, I th- that was also a display board for Necromunda. I have a plan. Uh, it's not like really a secret, but I, I hope by next Adepticon to have like an updated display case that's kind of like a like a construction site lunchbox that is going to be like their little base of operations. Uh, when it comes to the top three, yeah, I've I got second place at Adepticon, and then recently here at the KC Open, I made it to the top table, only to uh, get frust stymied once again. Uh, fun fact: the Adepticon before that, back right when they initially announced the golden tickets, I was at the top table for the group I was in for that, and got beat by a a, a Chicago regular Rob Poirier. For you, I don't know if I get his. I'm probably butchering poor Rob's name, but uh, he's a competent kill team player that's I've run into several times now. <laughs> yeah, I actually met Rob P. The I think when I went to Chicago, I did one practice game at the Dice Dojo. I want to say so. I played him there, and then I saw that he bumped into you at the Chicago Open, which was which was yeah, a fun and, and roundabout. Then he, Pulled off a cute little move maneuver in our final activation where he what would have been a two point victory for me turned into a draw, dropping me out of the top three for uh, the Ope, Chicago Open. So that Rob is uh, like my nemesis at this yeah. point. For Chicago, I was playing Hunter Clade. I think he was also playing Hunter Clade, one of, I think, four Hunter Clade players at Chicago, he if was. I remember correctly. Yeah. <laughs> a great team for fighting Wormblade. But as far as you know the community goes i don't think people are worried about gene stealer cults right now no uh people tend to discount them i'm not i'm not really sure why i think maybe uh that uh perhaps there's a bit of finesse that's required for them and people don't want to kind of i guess put in the time for them uh you can be punished pretty harshly by certain teams uh intercession are a common team that everyone likes to take and uh, Gene Steeler Colts don't really like them. Uh, the ability to fight, like shoot on death, uh, the fact that their guns kind of kill all your operatives in one roll. Uh, a good, a good roll, a good game of rolling by an intercession player can kind of upend even a, the best laid strategy for a Wormblade player. So I can see why that might get people. One of the big things that's coming up, though, it seems like GW is starting to move away from doing some in the dark boards, which, from what I understand, should help the Gene Steeler Colts, right? So, so yeah, it, the Wormblade uh, have a number. The cool thing about the Wormblade is they are fairly unique in their rules. Uh, the ploys, such as hiding or writhing ingress, they have, they have a number of ploys they can only do once per game, which is kind of also unique amongst teams. It's kind of like a throwback to the rules at the time. Uh, open is their preferred, uh, although and most people say that they're worse at Into the Dark, and I think that that general understanding is correct, although I don't think they're as low as people say. There are certain things about Into the Dark that kind of benefit them. Uh, uh, hatch uh, The mission action style of Into the Dark is really, uh, is really useful for some of their ploys' meticulous plan. Uh, yes, hiding and writhing ingress are useless on Into the Dark, but 
Uh, for example, like Pathfinders are a big nemesis of Wormblade, and Wormblade don't really have to worry about their marker lights and other nonsense into the dark. So there are trade offs, but yeah, your uh, Travis, your general understanding is that going back to open is kind of what they want because they get maximum usage out of their abilities. Yeah, the the Gene Steeler cults are probably one of the most unique rule sets in that if you don't really understand how their rules work, you will get beat by them. You'll get mercilessly spanked, from what I understand and from what I've seen. Yeah, they uh, they definitely are kind of like the gotcha team. Uh, that's why, like at this point, when I play against people, I ninety percent of people at a tournament haven't played them or have only played them a few times. So I try to be very clear and upfront in my rules. Um, it kind of swings. At first, they kind of whoop your butt. And if the person that's playing them isn't very good, you will end up whooping their butts. And then it kind of swings back again because they are a team that's very, I mean, it, the, the rules match kind of the fluff. You, you can kind of set your opponent in a strong kind of a turning point to horns of a dilemma set up where you have the locust, you have the killer morph, you have uh, very effective, like heavy weapons operatives that can get your opponent into like, two to three really uh, hard decisions going into turning point two. And with the rerolls, it makes those decisions uh, very reliable. Like you're, you're likely to lose a guy if you let them do that, you know, get you in those, uh, in those traps and they do have the numbers and uh, more, are more than capable of like killing an elite operative with, with their better guys. Yeah. So because you're playing Colts and they're kind of a gotcha team, when it comes to you running the Springfield, Illinois meta, are the players in your local scene, have they like adjusted or did you kind of move to the organization role to help them like learn the game so that you weren't just mercilessly slapping people down? How did how did you start up the Illinois scene? So I uh, so that's that's its own kind of little story, because uh uh, Springfield, Illinois, uh, used to be a very like popular 40 K scene. Uh, as you know, Adepticon is up in Chicago. That's only three hours away. Uh, one of our local store owners was very involved in kind of like, uh, the rules, um, the, the, the TOs like organization for Adepticon, but that guy fell out of, uh, he, he got out of 40 K and his store also, uh, closed right prior to COVID. And that's basically when I came, became the local TO for Warhammer 40K uh, for the area. Uh, fast fast forward, and we're kind of in the middle of ninth. I am not really enjoying ninth edition. Uh, I play Ultramarines. That's, uh, aside from my Gene Sailor Colts, uh, Ultramarines are like my only army. I don't have a lot of time to paint. Uh, and uh, I didn't like them. They were bland. The rules were boring and the new kill team hit and I wasn't immediately sold. So we had about three months with the compendium uh, before the white dwarf teams and stuff started really like getting out. And what I saw in white dwarf, I enjoyed. Uh, and then I just kind of pulled people in because we had a lot of guys who just weren't ready to make the step up to 40 K. They didn't have the time or the money. And uh, Kill Team finally kind of did what it was advertised to do, which was pull people in who weren't into, like, big-scale 40K. Uh, we got guys that were, like, playing Blood Bowl and guys that were inter interested in Necromunda. And the kind of the streamlined uh, rules of Kill Team, as you guys know, there's not... Outside of, like, rolling for your attack and defense, most of what happens in Kill Team is predetermined. You know, you don't have to worry about making charge rules or advance rules or any of that crap. And uh, it's really caught on. Uh, we play once a week on a Wednesday at the store and sometimes on the weekends if people have time. And uh, not to go on too long, but yes, uh, my Wormblade team did kind of frustrate people for a while. But most of the local guys are like aware of my shenanigans. And we get a lot of close games in, whether it's against like Blooded, Phobos. Uh, we got guys who play Breachers. Uh, I still tend to win most of my games, but... They don't let me. They don't let me win. I'll say that uh, I have to. I have to work for it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, roughly, how many people do you have in your local scene? Like, is it a is it a pretty popping group? Like, do you have a lot of people that show up every week, or like a bunch of people that show up sometimes, making for a decent scene? How's that looking? It's it's more of a bunch of people that show up sometimes. I would say, uh, like on a Wednesday night, we have. About eight people show up. Uh, since I'm a father of three sons, I 
I only make it in at 8 p.m. And then I get dirty looks from the store owner or from the from the store workers as I stretch that <laughs> stretch that 8 to 10 p.m. Like and they're like, hey, if the store is closing in five minutes. I'm like, cool. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so I uh, yeah, I'm a bit of a nuisance in that regard. But uh, we have about I would say a dozen, maybe a little more of people who kind of play somewhat regularly and then maybe. Me and three other guys who are probably the guys who play the most. I took a I took a small posse of guys to Kansas City and they all did very well. They all did three and two or better with a congrats. Uh, uh, well, in this thing, uh, uh, some of these guys also went to Adepticon with me. Uh, one of the guys I went with went three and zero with me in the team tournament. Uh, we didn't get first place because our battle points weren't high enough, but we went undefeated in that. Uh, and that's a guy that I had kind of beaten consistently, and it showed that. Uh, all those games paid off. His skills had uh, dramatically increased, and he was a, a strong partner from start to finish. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm a little curious. Uh, what factions were you guys playing in the team tournament? Uh, it ended up being Crute and my Wormblade, uh, mainly because... Uh. And uh, we we kind of wimped out. We want... Because uh, if you guys uh, have never been to Adepticon, Adepticon puts a lot on a uh, style. Uh, in fact, Adepticon is... If I'll plug for Adepticon real quick, it is, in my experience so far, the best event you can attend. Uh, it's it's kind of, there's kind of nothing like it at this point. But uh, we were going to do like a gene themed uh, like thing where uh, so recruits, you know, as the recruit uh, ingest the genes of their enemies and use those traits to modify themselves. And then obviously gene stealers are self-explanatory. We were going to dress up like in denim. And we were going to be like the gene stealers or the gene thieves, something like that. But that we, we kind of wimped out at the last moment. And uh, uh, Travis, you know, Zach Rochner, who is w- one of the event coordinators for GW, was uh, not impressed by our you know, how non-committal we were to this. So uh, I saw him in New Mexico and he was very committed to that outfit. So, yes, he was. Know. And he was uh, he was so he was not impressed by how non-committal we were to our team theme. But uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's what we took in our final game. We played against a Hunter Clayton Pathfinder combo, which <laughs> on paper is like not what you want. But we managed to we managed to get the Pathfinder player to play against my crew guy because uh, the Hunter Clayton thought that it, it was odd. Um, the Hunter Clayton player was not optimized to play Wormblade. He did not bring infiltrators, which I even suggested he should do. And he's like, well, all the models I have are um, the other guys. And I'm like, fair enough and that did it did uh not go as well for him as it could have if he had had um the ability to turn off my rerolls in close range yeah having a handful of infiltrators against these heavy reroll teams has been very good i use that to good effect in the hunter clade mirror matchup at chicago so i know the the power and because Wormblade have such an emphasis on the cult ambush ability where they can reroll all of their one dice result having probably like two or three of them turning off your rerolls would have been really miserable for both the locust and the, and the keller morph right yeah uh so for them it's actually not as much because they hit on twos and if i you know it's the odds of them doing major damage is pretty high but it really frustrates the shotgun guys who hit on threes and when they don't have that reliable rerolling that uh it those shotguns can be very surprising to players. Uh, often the shotguns can do anywhere from six to nine damage on people if they get a good, uh, you know, get all four hits in. Uh, and without rerolls, the odds of that drop off precipitously. Yeah. How is the do you run tournaments or are you mostly the most like practice rules organizer in your area? Do you guys run regular turns? How is the turnout better in those? Do you get people from like the St. Louis area, the Chicago area? Okay, so currently uh, the way it runs here in Springfield, Illinois, is uh, we have gone to a alternating monthly event uh, where I run both. For, I run 40k one month, and then I run competitive kill team the next month. Uh, these are like events that I bring up in BCP and request tokens. Uh, we've started to smuggle in casual 40k events that run alongside the kill team events. Uh, that's that's basically been a push to me to kind of like get more people to play kill team. Uh, we do get guys from St. Louis. Uh, you probably know Joe Bell from Chicago. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, Joe is kind of one of the head guys. He 
him and one of the other TOs from St. Louis regularly bring uh, anywhere from three to four players up. Uh, we are only get we are you know we're we're trying to get sixteen people on the regular. Uh, you got to remember that Springfield, Illinois, only does have about one hundred twenty thousand people in it, uh, and then St. Louis is ninety minutes away from us, and Chicago's three hours to the north. But we've uh, yeah we've attracted more people from around the area than you would think. We had guys come from South Bend, Indiana, which was four hours away uh, at our last event. And I uh, had a, I want to say we had right at 16 and it's a four, we do four rounds. I ended up plussing up to four rounds because the day is set aside for an event. Uh, 40K, as you know, pro- takes about, for three rounds, takes a full day, about yep. 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. And we figured out that we could basically pop in another round of kill team within that time window. And that uh, led to, uh, in our last event, led to like a more conclusive uh, finish with an undefeated player. Because once you hit six, uh, hell, I think it's 12. Uh, if you go beyond three rounds, you run the risk of uh, dual undefeated players, which we're, I was trying to get away from. Yeah. You know, for the New York scene locally, we actually do. I let people play their fourth round because it's generally the last two, three, zero players that really want to play the fourth round. So we just I just let them play it somewhere in the next like week and a half. And that's generally been fine. And I tie out everyone else just so that they can have that final prize payout and the whoever wins our monthly gets a little name up on a plate. Uh, yeah, I, for a uh, 40K, we do like, a, we did for the longest time, we did like plaques and stuff. But uh, mm-hmm. when you have a regular team, you notice that, or sorry, a regular scene, you notice that like the same people start to win all the time. And so after I handed the same guy a best painting award for like the 12th time, we, we started, we stopped kind of doing those for a bit. But uh, uh, maybe we'll do that more in the future if we get new people. Oh, yeah. My thing for painting prizes is that you like if you've won with that army, at least for kill team, it's nice because you can always get like people build new teams. So you can only win painting prizes for each team once. And that's definitely helped because that way people aren't reusing the same teams. Yeah, that's a good idea. I uh, when I talk about best painted, I'm talking about my 40K events. At the yeah. moment, I have stayed away from I don't even require painting for kill team oh, yeah. cuz no. trying to make it such an onboarding process, but yeah, uh if we uh have really good success with attendance here in July for our our normal monthly one, then uh I'll probably you know, probably get back to doing like maybe sportsmanship and stuff like that. But uh, at yeah. the moment we're doing it pretty bare bones just to have as big of a tent as possible yeah makes sense i mean you know personally for monthly tournaments my goal has always been the lowest basically everyone comes to play the monthly so we don't do painting points i generally fudge the two hour round timers as much as i can you know the first round bleeds into lunch second round i'll give them like 10 15 minutes and then the last round because it's the end of the day it's like Ideally, we would be done now, but I'll give you guys 10 minutes while everyone else is cleaning up. Everyone else is going to help me clean up. So these two guys, you get like 10 minutes. Yeah, you you hit it. That's basically exactly what we do, except with now the the fourth round chucked in. And that's, uh, you know, if people wanted to leave uh, that aren't like at the top, it wouldn't wouldn't upset me or anything like that. It's more to it's like you said, it's more for the guys that are at the top to see who can claim the glory, I guess. So what is your local meta like? Do you have the 50% Space Marine representation? I know you rep Colts. I assume you're playing the Cultists in your tournaments too? Um, so yes, I play the Cultists in my own tournaments. Uh, the The scene is... Uh, oof, let's see. So we got a number of guys who kind of play like a different thing every time. We have other guys who stick to the same thing pretty regularly. Uh, I will say the one thing, it's more of what we don't see. Uh, we have no Geller Pox players. We have people who own the team, but no one is like committed to taking them. Uh, but you'll, the other usual suspects you'll see, uh, it's not actually very Marine heavy, uh, at least not at, based off like the proportion of what probably the actual meta is. Uh, commandos are a very common site. I feel very... Uh, you know, very adept at playing his commandos. Uh, we have a lot of guys who like the higher tech circle. Um, they are all, they were all very happy to see that team receive its latest round of buffs. And I can say that uh, while I don't necessarily for my worm blade, it's not a team that I necessarily am worried about. Uh, I definitely can't just kind of blow the game off like I would in the past where it was, uh, Oh no, Necrons, this is so hard, but 
now they uh, they definitely you got to like stay on your toes if nothing else. And uh, for my Legionnaires who I recently started playing, uh, they do have the right tricks to make my Legionnaires cry if nothing else. Yeah, higher tech have some of the best shooting in the game. They just are saddled with eight activations where only six of them can be aggressive. Yep. But if they get up consistently, they are very scary. It's just yeah. eight activations is rough. Yeah, and I we'll get into it probably when we talk about the Chaos Cultists because we have a guy who's, we have a guy who started playing them. And uh this person had not beaten me uh ever. And then within a two games of playing with chaos cultists he uh thoroughly trounced me into the dirt and i think that getting back to higher tech circle briefly uh that is kind of like their flaw uh the reanimation protocol is not guaranteed uh sometimes your crypt tech dies and you don't even you roll a one or a two and he doesn't get back up and the game's over uh someone like chaos cults don't have to worry about that kind of stuff and their reliability is kind of as we'll get into is kind of what makes them a boogeyman yeah, that's great. I was actually one of my questions was going to be how many people are playing the new teams and like how much of the new teams are you seeing? So you got a little bit of cult. Um, have you seen much Inquisition out there um, or like Beastmen or the Votan or anything? Uh, I, we've seen them all uh, like we do have guys who regularly buy the new boxes uh, every time they come out uh, and kind of like a. Uh, uh, kind of like funny, considering we had a number of guys that were all on board for Hyrotech. There was an equal number of guys who were all on board for Hearthkin Ravagers, and I was, uh, or not, sorry, uh, Hearthkin Salvagers, and I was, uh, you know, <laughs> unhappy to report to them that they're just as bad <laughs> as the Hyrotech Circle was when they came out. So they were not uh, super stoked about that. But uh, they, uh, we got guys who did play the Inquisition team, uh, like in our practice games. Uh, and we also got guys that have played the Felgor. And so we, like I said, the, the, the big like gap in the local meta is really Geller Pox. Uh, other than that, we kind of see a bit of everything at one point in time. Uh, Pathfinders we saw for a bit, but kind of like how they've disappeared from the meta largely. No one here is really giving them the time of day in months. Yeah, I'm certainly interested in picking them back up if open becomes the lay of the land. So, you know, whenever this next box comes out, if it looks like we're going to be in a more open meta where I can actually set up marker lights again, maybe I'll pick them back up just for the fun. Yeah, I hate those guys. Don't. Yeah, your your team specifically has the worst issue for. So for players who are listening, who have no idea what the Pathfinder Wormblade mirror ma or matchup looks like, Wormblade have these two models called the cult agents they are the most powerful models on the team by a large margin but they have a defensive rule called preternatural assassin where they have a four up invuln and they can retain two cover saves pathfinders can put two marker lights on those models these vip models that need to be do a lot of work to stop them from retaining cover saves yep. and then force them to roll naked four up saves and as everyone just pour shots in and there's no chance they can ever make it through and the yeah. matchup is insanely terrible yeah it's not a fun matchup uh it really comes down to like how much heavy terrain sits on the board since the marker lights because as you mentioned like getting rid of cover saves is one thing but being able to treat the cultists as being engaged while under light terrain is another thing entirely because as anyone who plays Pathfinders knows, on your way to getting that fifth marker light, you get every single other buff. Correct. So the second the second they become uh, shootable, uh, they basically explode. And uh, if you're a Wormblade player, the first thing you do when you see a Pathfinder player across from you is go, where is the heavy train at? Because if it's not heavy train, you don't want to be on it. Yes, it narrows your allowed positions for these two very important models to yes. a very small set, subset of terrain on heavy yep. or on open boards. Speaking you of, you best. know, the operative showdown between the two most important cult agents, you know, between the Locust and the Sanctus Sniper or the Sanctus Talon or the Keller Morph, which of these four do you think is your favorite to use? And which one do you think is the most important for someone to learn? Okay, so my the be uh, he didn't ask me which one's the best, and that's the Keller Morph. The Keller Morph is <laughs> I actually, think everyone knows the Keller Morph knows is the this. best. Uh, the Keller Morph. Uh, <laughs> this is the my my advice to every Wormblade player is always: uh, don't lose your Keller Morph. Don't lose your Keller Morph. Uh, don't lose your Keller Morph. Uh, 
I don't always follow my own advice. Uh, in fact, if anyone read my review of Kansas City, I didn't follow my own advice, and a torment stomped my killer morph into the dirt in turning point two. And that cost me, probably cost me the game. But uh, the more interest, mastering the killer morph is not that hard. He, he works like a space marine, basically. Uh, if, you, if you're being cagey with him, you, you come out, shoot someone, and then maybe dash into like out of line of sight or something like that. If you uh, if you're looking to trade, you move him and try to double shoot two separate enemies and just, you know, hope that your opponent has to expend more actions than they wanted to to kill him. But ultimately, once you like commit him to something, he's he's toast. Uh, the the more interesting question everyone wants to know is, do I take the Sanctus operatives or do I take the Locust? And the the answer is the Locust is better. Uh, not only is the Locust better, he is the more interesting of the one and is the harder kind of operative to master because as we all know, uh, it's easier to kill people with guns than it is a melee. And uh, the Locust obviously being uh, almost entirely melee, uh, he can fight twice and getting him to kind of trade up for two enemies can be much harder than the Kelomorph. But the Locust is aggressive and he... He, he's a very good zoning operator. Uh, for, for people who don't know, he has the ability to kind of uh, set up in kind of like an ambush position where uh, think of him as a mine is the best way to like if you played Phobos and they have the mine that pops out. And if you get within three of it, it goes off. Uh, the Locust can kind of operate like that, except he springs into you. And uh, he also has the corn. Uh, 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 is it relentless Perpetual aggression? aggression. Perpetual, Perpetual aggression. aggression. He, has the, he has the equivalent of that to where every time he fights, doesn't even need to be the fight action, he just needs to have combat. Uh, he can then make a three-inch charge. There's no limit on the number of times he can do this either. So, uh, obviously, while he can only make two fight actions, if your opponent feeds him, you can kind of just daisy chain around with this guy. Uh, he pairs well with the abilities like, uh, with ploys like writhing ingress to let you put a hole in the wall. Uh, you can put a hole in the wall and then set up your little uh, booby trap on the other side and uh, then charge through the wall if you want. Or, uh, you know, he's he, he's just got a lot of good uses. He is almost destined to die uh, if you're using him properly. But uh, the reason I say he's better than the Sanctus Sniper and Talon is because obviously he can kill two operatives in activation. That's kind of the, the go thing. But then also the Sanctus Sniper is a static He's a static operative. And with Wormblade, you cannot... You, you think with 12 operatives, you could afford to keep someone back, but anyone who's played Wormblade knows that they die. They tend to die, start dying rather quickly in the mid-game. And if you have operatives sitting in your backfield that aren't uh, essentially being aggressive and playing two objectives, uh, you're going to really wish you had them. And you're giving up two operatives to take that Sanctus Sniper. Uh, the Talon, uh, he's just a shittier version of the Locust. He... he his 3-6 damage is underwhelming. He cannot one-shot any enemy operatives, uh, except for, like, maybe a Grot, which no one really cares about. Um, his little dash ability, unfortunately, is not that good. Uh, you can get someone in combat, kill them, and dash, and still be concealed. The um, uh, odds are, if you are in combat with your opponent, there are other enemy operatives very close nearby that don't give a shit about your ability to dash into cover. Um... It's he's just he's just bad. He doesn't have a backup gun. I mean, at least the Locust has his little barbed tail, which I have seen kill Space Marines um, <laughs> with a with a silent bolt pistol it has three inch range. It's kind of funny when it does happen. Uh, yeah, the my 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 designer commentary at this point is the Sanctus Sniper and the Sanctus Talon could share the same data sheet. You could combine all their abilities and they would be still worse than the Kelomar for Locust. Yeah, that was amazing. That was a great that was a great analysis, honestly. Like the best the best I've heard for the cults. Uh this is gold. It's almost like John writes professionally. Wow. And is one of the is like the best player for Gene Stealer cults. Yeah, professionally is a strong word. <laughs> we get paid for it. I, I, I do. <laughs> Hiring to the Bahamas any day now. <laughs> How often does the Locust actually get to do the setup on conceal, fire the barbed tail, 
do quick silver strike and then pass like is that actually a play that gets used or is that just something that we all read at the first day where we're like it, oh man this guy is sounds really spooky or do you just never do it because you'd rather just get in hit the expert swordsman fight two guys and move on with your day so you you obviously want to get the expert swordsman and merka guy uh like a common one is uh so legionnaires are uh, a strong team that everyone loves and like uh Wormblade, you're look you actually prefer to fight legionnaires over uh, intercessors i know that might sound odd but since the legionnaires have less wounds yeah the 12 uh, the 12 the 14 12, wound break point right yeah the 12 the 12 wounds on your standard legionnaire is like the sweet spot for something like the locust and it can very easily uh like for into the dark for example do a move and dash and do a hatchway fight that your opponent's not really expecting and uh before they know it they've lost like a butcher or um you know a gunner that they thought would be you know fine uh the the spring the quicksilver strike uh not many people actually get caught up in it it's that's very rare uh, your opponent has to purposely kind of they have to it's 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 telegraphed and your opponent it's basically just there to discourage them some people will go into it actively because they need to get the locus out of the way i've had had people do that uh I've had people do that and actually pull the locust out and kill him. Like that is a that is a valid strategy. You send like a a weaker enemy towards the locust and see if the locust player will take the bait, so to speak. Uh, so it's it's more useful against maybe elite teams. I've had it. Uh, it's useful against Phobos who don't want to be in close combat. They don't really have an answer to the locust. The reaver is the closest thing they have, and that requires kind of like them to really roll hot on the crits to stand a chance in combat against the locust. Uh, you asked about the tail strike. I have caught people with that where they think they, they don't realize they're in range to be hit by it. And you can kind of move and dash into heavy cover and stay concealed because the, the barbed tail is a silent weapon and then tail sting them and do some damage or even kill them because it is a bolt weapon. Yeah, it's got a good profile. So for people who don't know, Barb Tail is Locus's three inch gun. It's his tail, comes out, stabs someone, it's four attacks on threes, three, four, silent. And I think a lot of us when we first read the Locus's data sheet, you know, the spiciest play was normal move onto an objective, barb tail someone, quicksilver strike. No one can come here. If you want to shoot me, you gotta walk into my strike range so I can jump you in form the fight but i guess it's just i've never really seen it pan out and i was just wondering you know you're a Wormblade specialist it doesn't sound like that has really panned out for you as well no no like i said it's it's more it's more there to discourage people it's especially good on into the dark because uh you know no one wants to get near the door uh when he's set up like that you can do you can do cagey things and into the dark like set a barricade up uh near a door and then uh because most most people don't realize that it's only three inches to activate the quicksilver strike but the charge range of quicksilver strike is normal charge distance oh yeah so you can do fun things like set up a barricade near a door and if your opponent basically tries to enter the room you immediately stop them with quicksilver strike but you're still too far away to actually be shot uh because you know the barricade is two inches from the door you know slightly more than two inches from the door and you are concealed so it can just kind of utterly cut off like an an avenue of access especially on into the dark it's you know it's once again it's not really there to get people it's there to make them go oh, i'm not going that way so have you had any um hometown heroes from springfield illinois who used to get got by the locust but they've played against it enough and now they've ascended do you have any stories yeah. about players who have gotten much better against Wormblade over time yeah um uh so I got two players, uh, Ryan, who went with the KC, uh, Ryan Lamatia, and uh, Brett Ross. Uh, Ryan uh, tends to play Blooded, uh, and his Blooded and my Wormblade have lots of have a storied history of just beating the tar out of each other. Uh, he also plays Phobos every once in a while, and I, I fear his Phobos far more than I do his Blooded. Uh, Phobos are, I think, a very strong team in general now, and uh, they have they basically counter a lot of the Wormblade tricks. So I don't I don't really like them, but uh, he he's he's gotten much better at uh, kind of like dealing with my agents. Uh, their ways, you know, Blooded do have their own tricks. Uh, their weakest thing is they don't really have anything that gets them up the table faster at the beginning of the game. Uh, and that's where I try to kind of take the advantage with my Wormblade. You know, with things like meticulous plan and hiding. Try to 
be aggressive if I can, but he sees that coming. And so he's usually setting up a turning point two to not let me just have my way. Um, and then Brett Ross plays hand of the Archon. Uh, he went four and one at KC and, uh, uh, his hand of the archon. We've kind of come to the conclusion that hand of the archon are kind of pl- they're It's it's a hard matchup for hand of the archon. Uh, my worm blade have everything, have everything they need to fight them, but it's not like hand of the archon are helpless, and they they are a very strong team. And uh, he's he's used things like the torment grenade uh, to uh, treat my agents as injured. It's, it's the torment grenade scares the shit out of everyone. No one no one likes it because it can shoot you through a wall. Uh, um, yeah, uh, mo- my, most of the locals here are not going to give me like a, a two kill expert swordsman. It's it's I kind of accept it. Uh, that's not what you want with your agents. The Kalamorph is obviously the best at, you know, trading up. But the Locust is your second best. And even even if even if your opponent's not going to give you two kills, uh, you can still kind of like dictate the flow of where they're going to go with the locust because there it's it's kind of it, it does that locust kind of does the same thing as like blast weapons and torrent weapons uh, a lot of people most good players don't get caught by torrent but that you got to play around it it's just another thing to worry about yes that's right so, like someone could easily think that like blast is not having an effect on the game if they if you know if you don't look closely but you know it is because people are positioning entirely differently so those kinds of threats are like super duper silent killers yeah it, uh, it takes a mental it, it's just another thing to think about uh when i when i go when i play against people and i ask like hey you got any blast or torrent and they're like no i'm like oh thank god now i don't have to like expend nearly as much mental energy on my positioning because i'm not worrying about that kind of stuff exactly yeah, um, also, shout out to Brett Ross, I played him at Adepticon, and I was playing Hand of the Archon, and it was a mirror match, and uh, it was a very good game. Um, he was a great opponent, he was he was fun, he was cool, his models looked way better than mine. <laughs> I'm glad you guys got to play, I didn't realize uh, you had a... Yeah, Brett had a really good time, and he he's really taken to kill team, he's, he's one of our 40k regulars, uh, he's walked away with a fair number of, like... Uh, awards in 40k both for his painting and for his uh kind of strategic acumen and uh he's no less uh competent and guilty so yeah i 100 percent see that he was definitely um from the pod that i played uh no offense to anyone else at that pod he was he really like he had me sweating i was like uh, honestly it was just the dice that that won me that game this is the pod that you won right uh yes yeah, yeah. At Adepticon, between the seven games I played, I didn't lose anything. It's kind of radical. Oh, you didn't lose a single game. True. Um, I didn't play in like the GT. I did just like because I had to work that oh, weekend. Oh, you did the starter pods. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I did like the starter pods, and then um, and then I did the team tournament with my guy Alex. We were uh the monofilament Rhapsody. We took oh, first yeah. place. You guys were right behind us in third place, right? Uh, no, we got first place. Yeah, you're first place. That's right. We yep. didn't get to run into you. Yeah, that yeah, was a that was a fun event. We we yeah, brought the are, the dual elf menace. Where I was playing hand of the archon, and then my teammate Alex was playing uh, void dancer troop. So we were just uh, yeah <laughs> jumping around uh, and slicing play, people. I'll play against hand of the archon any day over. I I was I haven't played void dancers since they got some of their nerfs, but. Uh, they're one. Of, they're always one of my least favorite teams to play against. I'm like, I hate this team. They got. They can do everything. Fuck them. <laughs> yeah, you know, at at ACO this weekend, talking about you know the new boogeymen, the new cultists on the block, as it were. Uh, we had a handful. We had four Void Dancer players and five Chaos Cultists, and I think the Void Dancer players all thought they had a pretty good game plan against. The new boogeyman, the Chaos Cultists. Yeah, uh, I guess we can get in. Is this a good time to get into Chaos Cultists? Is... Yeah, we can get we can get into it. The, the new boogeyman of Kill Team. We're here. I mean, you're you're the old you're the old news at this point, John. With the yeah, I am the, the old news. I am uh, I am also I guess the first victim of the Chaos Cultists too because they only been out like one week. That's tr- that's true. You yeah. were at the first major U.S. tournament where they were yeah, allowed. It, and uh, yeah, they had me. Uh, I, I knew. Oh, you, as you know, Travis, like you, you saw my commentary when we kind of did the review on them. And I'm like, I don't like this. 
And uh, when I saw that there were multiple people running them at KC, you know, I got nervous. I I did get the uh, I did get to play a couple practice games against the local guy with them. And I, I or I should say one I I won. But it became very clear to me the only reason I won is because the mission it had a it was a mission act it was loot it required mission actions, and uh, that is kind of my assessment of Chaos Cults at this point. They are uh, incredibly strong. Uh, late game, their mission action capabilities obviously drop off because everything's a torment or a mutant. So if you you know if you deal with most of the commune and there's no devotees left on the table, you can get an early point lead and beat them. Uh, but this does not apply to capture, in which case uh, they have strong odds of just kind of <laughs> Existing. running you right off the table. <laughs> so, uh, I, I I think it's been over like I've seen people, tons of people discussing this point. Uh, I'm not going to make any recommendations on what should change because there's so many things that could be changed. Uh, I will say that so perhaps the most oppressive thing about them is uh, re- the, the the utter reliability of their abilities, uh, the relentless on the mutants and the torments means that, that they're almost always going to get two crits on you uh, when they're in, which is pretty brutal. Uh, there's there's a number of other things, but uh, the team is just insanely reliable, uh, definitely over tuned in my opinion. And the fact that, yeah, Void Dancers, uh, a team that, yeah, on paper kind of has everything they need to kill them, especially on an open board, kind of just uh, highlights the power. Uh, in my game against uh, Sh- um, Sh- uh, the Blaine, Blaine the man from Maine at uh, KC, uh, I killed four of his operatives in Turning Point One, and I was feeling pretty confident. And he was sweating bullets, and you could you could see the stress level transfer from him to me <laughs> as the game went on, and uh, it was definitely one of those like. And I mentioned in my review, I could have won that game, uh, but the fact that it required me to kind of play perfectly while he can just hemorrhage guys is a um, it's it's a hard uh, position to find yourself in. Uh, my worm blade definitely can't lose four operatives in turning point one again in any matchup and still pull it out. So uh, that a team can do that uh, does not, I guess, uh, speak well for balance. It's a actually a common thing. So at ACO this last weekend where I TO'd, uh, there were multiple games where the Chaos Cults were able to come back from a anywhere from a three to five model deficit on turn one. So I definitely have seen that mirrored. So I just got to say, I've I've only played against the Chaos Cults once, um, but I killed like six or seven on turn one. And then like... Then my opponent was like, oh, I'm sorry. And he went easy on me. And and then, like, I won by one point. And I was like, if he didn't go easy on me and forget, like, half his rules, I would have been annihilated. Even killing, like, six in one turn. Yeah. So, you know, for all the listeners, you know, there's a lot of doom and gloom here. But if you were to look at one thing that you could do well against the cults on your next round, like, what do you think would be a killer, a killer thing outside of, obviously, you know, hopefully GW is responsive and gives them a light tap on the head? Uh, what do you mean? Like, what what are should players look to try to do to uh, yeah. win? Yeah, how would you approach the cult matchup in another tournament? Like you said, you had Blaine sweating on turn one. If you could do it all back, you know what would be one or two things that you wish you could have done? Okay, so the the big one was uh, so you're kind of trying to balance two things here. Uh, you're trying to get as many of their operatives on turning point one as you can. However. You don't want to set yourself up to get trampled by torments, meaning you don't want to. Obviously, someone is going to get it. Uh, mm-hmm. You just want to make sure it's someone expendable. Obviously, this is harder if you're on elite team, uh, especially for like intercession. I don't have a good answer for you because uh, torment will absolutely annihilate <laughs> and even an assault intercessor. Uh, but in the case of my worm blade, uh, my Keller Morph, I tried to I, I used his hyper sense to to basically snipe a devotee that was kind of towards the center of the table. And uh, this set him up to be charged by a torment. And I lost him. If I had not done that with the Keller Morph, the Keller Morph is one of the operatives more than capable of killing a torment. Uh, maybe even in one round of shooting, if you, you know, crit hot, uh, which you can do with Worm Blade if you do Coil Serpent for an auto crit and rending. Uh, so yeah, I guess you want to keep your, it, it, you want to early on get it, 
if you can get a turning point one lead, do it. Pick off as many as them can and keep as many of your key threats out of charge range when turning point two hits. That's that's kind of what you're going for. Uh, against uh, Blaine, I had basically seated a side to him, trying to get him to come into me and envelop him. And I kind of forgot my own plan, which is what I got my Kelomorph killed. But on uh, the other flank, I had been very aggressive with like my Locust and some of my regular guys. And I had a very strong position uh, going into it. Um, they allowed my Locust to charge uh, one of his Blessed Blades and then, or sorry, one of his Devotees and then Expert Swordsman into the Iconarch. And the Iconarch does what Iconarch does, which is frustrate the shit out of you. <laughs> because <laughs> he just won't die um but uh, uh again you know the plan uh made sense and that's what you're kind of going for is especially if it's secure loot focus on devotees and dark commune uh if you have stunning weapons take them the torments can fight twice but they can only do it once per phase uh only one of them once per phase so if you can stun these enemies uh it's very good uh it definitely seems to let up some of the pressure um if you're playing capture once you have the the objective captured move off of it don't stay on it because the tormus will then charge you on it and basically your opponent has to choose whether to take the objective or attack you at that point because have no guns you know outside of like a few things so there there are there are ways to kind of mitigate it, but it's going to be an uphill battle. You cannot prevent your opponent from making five up field no pains, things like that. And you just you're um, you're maybe trusting too much in luck, but uh, focus on denying the mission actions uh, capabilities on secure and loot and on capture. Uh, I don't I wish I had a better answer uh, for capture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, you know, coming back from ACO, I talked to Shane. Shane got first at ACO with Chaos Cults. Only lose, only, uh, his only match that he was really, really worried, I think, was the mirror match where things just got, like, very ridiculous. But he mentioned that aiming for the Iconarch regularly might not be the best plan because it just has so many layers of defense. It generally has one just a scratch from the equipment. It has mm -hmm. the minus one damage aura that it gives to itself and anyone next to it. And it has the damage amplification. So if you run up to it, it's probably going to get you because it's got, I think, eight wounds on a five up save, which is not great. But when you're minus one damage and the minimum is two, you can take a lot more fire than anyone would expect. So similarly to the flare on Hand of the Archon, maybe it's best to just ignore him and deal with all the other models around him. Another thing is making sure that you get the mutants when you can because cults need to go from mutants to torments and they can only do the mutations once each round. So were you able to find angles to have models just axe the mutants or did you find mutants tougher than you expected? Mutants are always tougher than you expect. And if you do have a gun that can take them out, go for it. But uh, an intelligent Chaos Cultist player is not going to give you the opportunity to get the mutant. Like that's that's you, you should assume that um, that's why I say like devote it's there's a, they're, they got a lot of models and they have trouble hiding them, but they can hide two mutants. Uh, so you should uh, if you have a way, if you if you're confident, you can get the mutant. Definitely take it. But don't count on your opponent giving it to you. I guess don't overextend for mutants either. Right. Yeah. Don't overextend for them, because um, especially if you are a team that's like Hornblade. Uh, where your opponent... So I have had games where I've killed both mutants. And then guess what happens after that? Uh, three devotees charge into my neophytes, who are not very good in combat, and immediately turn into mutants anyway. So... Oh, I see. So, so don't... Yeah, it's, it's one of those... At the end of the day, you are still trying to not get charged. I see. And, so the, the problem is there's a couple different spot ways that you can mutate. So throwing a couple dudes to kill the mutant means that a devotee can charge survive a melee combat and then turn into a mutant anyways, which is one of their other triggers. So yeah, you have to be very, very careful about actually getting ready. So it may be better to just set up kind of like a, an ablative charge zone where the Tormans can get one guy, but never two guys, right? Correct. Uh, and yeah, you, if you can pull those Tormans in on turning point two and just kill them, uh, then your opponent only has, should only have one mutant 
to torment in turning point three. That's true. Uh, this is still very difficult because if they are playing aggressive, which they should be doing, they're probably going to have multiple devotee, uh, devotee like charge options mm-hmm. in turning point two. Uh, now you can set it up to where at least when they do charge and turn to a mutant, that allows you to kind of counterattack and kill that mutant. Uh, however, as you as you pointed out, uh, the mutants are much more durable than you think they are. I've seen I've seen them survive the Keller morph, like a you know the full shooting action of the Keller morph. Uh, you would think you know a seven wound model, but if your opponent spikes uh, with those feel no pains, it's not going to matter. Uh, it's yep. it's feel no pain is uh, perhaps one of the strongest abilities in the game because it's not something you can get rid of. Uh, I don't think there's any team that can deny feel no pains. Uh, and yeah, yeah it's, right now, feel no pains are the most powerful defensive ability in the game, especially on a five up. Once you're at a five up, feel no pain. I think the damage curve smooths out into like a nice, clean, round curve. So if you've ever used one of the damage simulators, normally there's a pretty big step as you hit different save numbers. But once you have a five up, feel no pain, all of the damage curves smooth out a lot, and there's tons of variability. Yeah, like you're... the. 13 wounds of a torment or the seven wounds of a mutant can feel like anywhere from like <laughs> 10 wounds to like 13 wounds and then like 13 wounds to like 20 wounds almost. Yeah. You're you're absolutely correct. Uh, like a team that's got the correct feel no pain number is Hand of the Archon. Uh, they get a six up uh, usually. And uh, that's perfectly situated to kind of keep them alive one wound longer than they should have. Yeah. And that's that's kind of where they need to be. Not Oh, my opponent needs to, I don't know, uh, shoot shoot a uh, seven wound guy with a mining laser to ensure he dies. Yeah, yeah. that kind of thing. And I then they have 14 it's... more. Yeah, stun, it does seem like pretty good because you're ca- they're capped at three torments over a game. If you can stun two torments, the most that they're going to do is like charge and hit someone, which is bad, but it's far, like if they charge, hit you with their bonus melee attack, and then that's it, that's not that bad that's actually okay all things told yeah. because i think what i remember seeing is a lot of torments getting charged two fights and that just seemed like the game was over at that point yes uh their base is huge their movement is obscene uh especially when they take winged and uh the plus one inch to move it means nine inches and they ignore uh the first traversable or two inches of climb uh they get where they want and it that can also just be incredibly uh frustrating you there's sometimes no way to get away from the dang things. Yep. Uh, the injury aura that they put out is also really important to remember. Yes. It's a two inch injury aura and it's just there. So for, yes. you know, anyone who's worried, you know, get as many devotees as possible, but don't commit your models too far forward. I think at ACO, I saw that happen a handful of times where you would get out like four or five models on turn one, but your all of your pieces are now in the mid board. And it just means that, the following turn all of the torments are all over you and that was just a recipe for disaster uh exactly the the other thing is kind of uh the the torments are oh shoot what i was gonna say that they have the relentless they also explode on death uh just just to say screw you i think the thing i was gonna get at is actually while stun is reliable some teams have zero access to stun and that is not a good uh if that's like the one thing you've identified as kind of like a weakness for a team uh that's not good yeah it's definitely rough i think for maybe a team like phobos where you have the omni scramble ability you might be able to hold the omni or when does mutation happen does it happen at the beginning of the turn or does it happen somewhere in the strap ploy ploy, okay yeah so hopefully you can omni scramble one of the big boys and then uh, run away from him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, the, another, yeah. Another aside from uh, KC was that uh, uh, the Garrett Senior. <laughs> that's, what I'll, that's what I'll call him. I, uh, I believe his name on BCP right now is Papa Garrett. Papa Garrett. Uh, went undefeated with Phobos. That's kind of like the, uh, the, the low light or like the, I guess, the mist thing is that there are some competitors lurking in the background that are very nasty that Chaos Cultists have briefly eclipsed. Uh, Felgor Ravager is kind of being another one. Uh, Phobos are, are really good. Uh, he did beat it. Uh, the other Chaos Cultist player is the only reason that guy was 4-1. Uh, 
Uh, on an open board especially, Phobos can be incredibly good at just kind of chewing apart uh, the Chaos Cultists because they are also one of the faster teams. They also get plus one to movement. They also get to ignore Traverse. And if you're being cagey and kind of just running along the flanks and shooting across the table, you can um, make most of those cultists go away. Yeah, setting up reaver charges where you can actually get into the back line much earlier than they would expect and slicing up two guys and setting up bolter pistols is also definitely a thing they can do. And because they have Omni Scramble, if you have backup, if they try to torment you, you can stun them and get get the heck out of dodge. Yeah, uh, another team, uh, Legionnaires, uh, potentially very strong against Chaos Cultists. Uh, I uh, played a game recently against... a. Uh, our local guy who's been playing them. And uh, it was one of the, is another example of just the reliability of the chaos cultists can really uh, be something that will take you by surprise. I thought I had him pretty firmly and we went into turning point four and I had a shrive talon uh, charge into a three wound torment, do no damage to the torment and then get stomped into the dirt by the torment. Oh, man, the, the injury bubble really got you. Yeah, it's, injury bubble gets you. Um, but on paper, and, you know, given, you know, average dice rolls, uh, Legionnaires do not give up uh, devotee mutations very easily. Uh, did you did you happen to try corn against devotees? Because one of the other things is corn seems well situated for the Chaos Cultist matchup because you can just <laughs> run at your opponent that much faster. I went corn and Zinch and uh, that that was on paper in my head. And uh, it was one of those games where uh, it did actually go according to plan until like the very end and things mm -hmm. just kind of fell apart. But uh, I think Legionnaires are a strong team against Chaos Cultists. And if Chaos Cultists get their what we assume will be some sort of change in the future, uh, Legionnaires are a great team to like kind of take into this. Yeah, for players who don't know, like the corn Legionary Shrive Talon with perpetual aggression up and charge, fight someone kill them and then pass and minus APL to a mutant or a torment that should stick around even though they change form and then perpetual aggression to someone else stab someone kill someone else and do it again so theoretically the Shrive Talon can do a whole lot of heavy lifting and then a Zinch Balefire can snap a fireball off on like three or four guys and just nuke nuke a whole set of devotees I think that that's like the two the two arcs of the game plan is you know my guess yeah. Yeah, and then uh, your uh, if you're taking perhaps like the chosen, uh, he kills devotees in a single hit, regenerates uh, wounds when he does so. Uh, yeah, uh, you can't just you just can't say no to a team that has like two plasma options, which will annihilate torments if you get a good roll on them. Uh, so yeah, they're uh, I, I would give them much stronger odds than my warm blade at the moment when going into chaos cultists. Same here. Being being super lethal on turn ones through four is definitely a big part. And Wormblade are hyper lethal on turn one and just progressively get weaker as most games go on. Yeah. Like as I mentioned, the teams that cannot prevent devotee mutation in close combat are teams that are by definition going to have a hard time. Uh you, you cannot stop the devotees from getting into you at some point. And uh if you're just giving them free mutants. So it doesn't kill, matter how many you kill, because there's always another one there. Yeah, for actually, you know, come to think of it, for any veteran guard players out there, you know, setting up your melee weapons. So you got you got your frontline dorks with uh, trench trench axes and clear the lineup. Those might actually be relatively useful in this matchup because you've uh, already uh, got Commando, the guns. Commando is another incredibly strong team against yep. Chaos Cultists. Uh, commandos have most Commandos players know that. Commanders have a lot of shenanigans uh, that kind of work around sneaky git, uh, especially. And uh, if you're if you're smart and you have like a balanced team, you can counterplay these. Uh, whether it's you know stopping a stopping a boy with a stick bomb or a stick of dynamite, or you know just not letting like a sneaky sniper boy get on you. But in the case of the Chaos Cultists, since they have no guns uh, and very few uh, ranged weapons in general. Uh, it allows kind of commandos to kind of have their run of the table at the beginning. And uh, you can you can do some frisky stuff, whether it's, you know, uh, using a, a dynamite, uh, you know, give plus one AP to a guy with dynamite. So he, to like a breacher boy so he can come through a wall and hut the dynamite or even 
you know, be safer and take the stick bomb and try to get like a group of guys at the very beginning of the game. Uh, yes, cultists have a lot less counterplay against this kind of stuff. Yeah, that's true. On turn one, starting everybody on gauge so that you can take as many pot shots as possible. Always a good plan against these all melee teams going for both Chaos Cultists and Ravagers. Super valid. Yeah, you know, uh, I haven't played my Casterkin in a while, but I'm like, you know, with the upgraded knives and Furcadia, like maybe you can get a little bit of enough melee. Plus they have a lot of hard hitting weapons and they've got blast weapons and they've got all the flexibility and they love to go all engage. I'm curious to try to give a whirl with Casterkin. So if uh, someone mm-hmm. listening has tried Casterkin versus cults, join our discord and let us know how it happened yeah we'd love to hear from my quick thought on that is look i love casterkins uh just conceptually they are perhaps the i i I like to describe them as the most honest team they don't have a lot of got uh they have my favorite comms guy the one who can actually use a radio properly and doesn't need to like see a dude to radio him um but at the same time Kasserkin would rank pretty high on the list of teams, at least in my mind, that are going to have a hell of a time against Chaos Colts. Uh, you're just you're down so many activations if your opponent's being cagey. Uh, Kasserkin, if I recall, don't they're not especially fast at the table. Oh, so fast being, is their like main thing. Not on turn one, play. but you know, all other turns yeah. they've got a good amount of maneuverability. Can, that said. They've got good. They've got good guns. I we did have a Casterkin player at ACO this last weekend, who ran into a couple issues on those attacks where you just hit like ones and twos, and then you're just sitting there like I can not doing anything. Them. Yeah, where your elite points can only do so much, which will be rough against devotees. But those fifteen models definitely put a hamper on a lot of potential game plans. I'm really hoping for you know maybe one or two devotees just getting removed. Well, and as you saw, though, it's it's unclear if that's even the proper solution, because uh, as most Chaos Cultist players can go into the second round of the game down a third of their team and it plays basically identically as if it. I think if I think if you were down a third of your team and you already started two models down, it might go a little bit worse because they did run into some scoring issues on a handful of missions loot being the big standout mission. So for anyone who's listening, if they want to try a matchup where the cultists are bad, loot is the one that everyone says they didn't like. So you give that one a try and let us know how it goes on the discord. Yeah, definitely uh, play yourself like either go in one or two directions. Start at loot, which is like the easiest, easy mode air quotes against chaos cults and work your way to capture or start at capture. If you want to start a hard mode and see if you can actually take them and uh, then work your way to easier missions or more favorable missions, I guess, is the best way to put it. Yeah. Any other shout outs you want to give out to anyone in the Springfield, Illinois scene? Uh, no, not Springfield. Uh, uh, if any of you guys are actually listening, I love you. <laughs> um, but, you know, this is one of our longest podcasts by a, a mile right now. <laughs> so... Thanks. I just wanted to say thank you for coming on, John. I know we're, you know, co-writers on Goonhammer and it's been really good, you know, meeting you at Chicago and having you on and hearing about the hometown heroes. <laughs> yeah, uh, I guess real quick, then uh, our, our club is the Rail Splitter Ruffians. Um, if, you, if you're looking for us on BCP uh, and I guess not a shout out to Springfield, but uh, the St. Louis guys, uh, the Gateway Gamers. Uh, run a, a big 40k big, just a big Warhammer event in Collinsville, Illinois, which is like fit 10 minutes from St. Louis uh, and it's going to have a 32 person 5 round uh, Kill Team GT in oh. two minutes. Hey, that's good. I mean, this comes out on the 29th, so hopefully if anyone here is listening and they want to do a 32 person GT, that sounds great. Yeah, uh, for the two Midwest listeners, uh, get your butt there. Oh, you know, right here, co-host. Jason. You know, I've got to <laughs> say we've got there. we've got a handful of Midwest listeners because I'm from Minnesota, and when I go places, people tell me about the podcast, so I know we've got some Minnesota listeners. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, get out there and uh, go crush, go crush John's worm plate. Everyone. Oh. Now, now that you know um, all his secrets. Uh, 
uh, play all the teams I like to play against. Bring a Casterkin. Bring. <laughs> uh, I like playing against Vet Guard. Bring Vet Guards. Um, no Pathfinders. No, no Chaos Pathfinders, Cultists. Uh, no Chaos Cultists at all. Uh, Hunter Clade uh, is it into the dark. Uh, don't want to play against you if it's open. Fine, sure, whatever. <laughs> Well, thanks again for coming on, John. This has been a very fun episode. Very insightful. Um, yeah. Uh, and for the listeners, we've got that Discord that we've been mentioning a couple times. We've got a Patreon. We've got a couple other exciting things coming on, which uh, may or may not involve some cool physical gadgets that you can have in your hands soon. Uh, just a quick little teaser. And if you made it to the end of this podcast, thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Yes, if you made it to the end of the podcast, the secret key word to leave in the comments and to say when you join the Discord is... I should have thought of something. Uh, I don't know. Pancakes. Thunder? Pancakes. The secret key word is pancakes. Well, thanks again for listening. Have a wonderful day. Thank you.